Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Gabelli School Centennial Speaker Series webinar. Thank you for joining us for today's event featuring Leo Melamed talking to us about his book, Man of the Futures. My name is Srish Chatterjee, Professor of Finance and Business Economics at the Gabelli School and Gabelli Chair in Global Security Analysis. And it's my pleasure to be here on behalf of the Gabelli School. The Gabelli School Centennial Virtual Speaker Series began in 2020, marking 100 years of purpose-driven business education at Fordham. In the last year, the Gabelli School for Global Security Analysis and our wonderful partners, the Museum of American Finance and CFA Society in New York have sponsored more than 30 events that drew nearly 5,000 attendees. We are tremendously proud of this dynamic partnership and a full archive of our video content will be shared in the thank you email you will receive. Today's session features Leo Melamed, the founder of Financial Futures and initiator of Globex, the world's largest global electronic trading system. A true commodities pioneer, Leo's recently released memoir recounts his journey from Holocaust survivor to becoming one of the most prominent leaders in the world of finance. Leo will be featured in conversation with Bob Pisani, senior markets correspondent for CNBC. And in just a moment, I will hand this off to David Cowen, president and CEO of the Museum of American Finance, who will give Leo a proper introduction. Following today's discussion, David and Bob will facilitate audience questions, which we would ask that you type into the Q&A section near the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our speakers will be addressing as many of them as possible during the session. I also want to share that copies of Man of the Futures will be raffled off to attendees. Before I turn it over to David, I want to warmly ask that you consider making a donation to the Museum of American Finance or a gift to the Gabelli School Centennial Fund. You can make a tax exempt gift quickly and securely online at the links provided in the chat. Now, without further ado, I turn it over to David. Thanks, Sarish. Great to be back with you, our Fordham friends and audience. And our speaker today has an incredible journey to share. As a child, he was on the run with his parents to escape Poland and the Nazis. And it turned into a two year ordeal through Russia, evading the equivalent of the KGB to come to America, and all of this because of a righteous Japanese diplomat who let them have passage through Japan to come to America before we entered the war. Moving to Chicago, uh, Leo worked many odd jobs to put himself through law school. And then thinking he was applying to be a runner for a law firm because the name Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner and Smith had to be so, he ended up at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and the rest is truly legend. From runner to visionary board chair, Leo is the father of financial futures, the creator of the IMM. And so this is where we trade financial instruments and currency futures for the first time. He led the revolution to electronic trading, and he's also known for his integrity and created and led the self-regulating body, the National Futures Association known to us as the NFA. Now, Leo's got multiple books to his credit. For all things Leo, check out www.leomalamed.com where there's literally hundreds of essays and articles to read. Now, Leo's won many awards and accolades, and I'm gonna highlight just two, one past and one in the future. For all of his achievements, both in the markets and as someone who shined a bright light on that Japanese diplomat who saved his family, Leo received the Order of the Rising Sun, the highest honor bestowed on an individual by the Japanese emperor. 
Well, I'm pleased also to announce we're going to shine a bright light in the future on Leo as he will receive our Financial Innovation Award at our 2022 gala in March. Now, when you first open this book, you'll see the introduction is by Chris Giancarlo, the former head of the CFTC. And if you're a regular in this series, you know, just a few short weeks ago, uh, Chris is part of a panel in this series. Now, Leo will be joined by Bob Pisani, a senior markets correspondent for CNBC, where he's been since 1990. He is a great friend of this museum, frequent contributor to our magazine, our 2021 gala MC. He'll be our 2022. Gala MC and I am pleased to report that as of last night, Bob is now a member of our board of trustees. So in conclusion, there's a lot of sage advice in this book. One to share is that in business, you are either retreating or advancing. There's no middle ground, coast at your own peril. Well, there'll be no coasting today. So let's start advancing with Bob and Leo and Man of the Futures. Thank you, David. Uh, really appreciate that introduction, and I'm very honored to be uh, to have joined uh, the board of trustees of the Museum of American Finance. A great honor uh, for me, and it's a, a great honor for me to talk to to this man, uh, to Leo Malamed. Uh, there are a, a handful of truly, truly great innovators uh, in the last uh, 75 years, uh, and Leo is among them. Uh, I want to talk about financial futures and why that was so important, but I'll just start off by saying Nobel laureate Merton Miller said about this, with the launch of financial futures, Leo Malamud introduced the modern era of finance. He called financial futures, this is Merton Miller, the most significant innovation of the past two decades. He said that in the early 1990s, and I'm sure he would still agree it matters a lot. The man is Leo Malamud. He's got a book out, Man of the Futures. We'll want to talk about that. And the way we're going to do this, and I promise we'll get you out in an hour, is the way we usually do this. We'll talk a little bit about Leo's early life. We'll talk about his arrival at the Merck and his significant groundbreaking contributions in the 1970s and 1980s. But I want to leave a little bit of room at the end to talk about the current day situation and his feelings uh, about certain developments in the markets and how he feels the futures markets are going to develop uh, uh, from here. We'll also keep an eye on the questions, of course, uh, and I want to hear from anybody out there who has a question for Leo. So I promise we'll get you out in, a, in, a, in an hour. Uh, Leo, a great pleasure to talk with you again. Uh, you know, you reminded me, I, I interviewed you 20 years ago when I came down on the floor of the Merck. Uh, it was a great honor to meet you then, uh, and it's a great honor to meet you again here. I just want to pick up where David left off with the Holocaust story, because it's such a poignant story. I wonder if you could very briefly tell people what happened, because if it wasn't for the, the, the kindness of a Japanese consul in Lithuania, you might not even be here right now. So could you very briefly tell us how you got out uh, uh, of a very dangerous situation uh, during the very beginning of, of uh, World War II? Well, thank you, Bob, for that introduction and thank the museum for this opportunity. Um, I was seven years old when uh, World War II broke out and the, the Nazis captured Poland in something like seven days. And our city, Bialystok, was captured by the Germans. And my father, who I believe is one of the most brilliant people I have ever met, knew to run. Uh, it's an incredible story because most people don't particularly run and we know what happened to six million Jews who did not, but he did. He took his wife and my, his son, my, my seven-year-old person, and we ran first to Lithuania. And from Lithuania, we were, of course, captured by the Russians who had uh, begun the the war with uh, oh, the, the after the Germans attacked the Russians. And subsequent to that, as uh, Bob indicated, we were fortunate enough to receive a transit visa from Poland, from Lithuania to Japan. Um, this visa was given by Chiyun Sugihara, a great humanitarian, who issued over 2,000 such visas, which represented something on the order of 6,000 people. 
and we ended up in Japan. This whole history included a, a Trans-Siberian trip that took over two weeks to cross all of Siberia and get to Vladivostok. And for a seven-year-old, uh, this was a momentous, of course, and uh, left certain indelible thoughts and memories in my mind. It is an amazing story. Uh, that, that consul, that Japanese consul, uh, Sugahara, um, saved your family's life essentially had he not acted uh who knows what could have happened but if it, it, it certainly wouldn't may not have been a acceptable outcome for sure i just want to move on i wanted you to get that story and thank you for that um to uh, you getting involved in the futures market and david alluded this as well but it's a very it's kind of amusing that you were you were an, an attorney by profession and you seem to have gotten involved in futures by a little bit by accident so Merrill Lynch was looking for a runner, uh, and you were thinking um, that it, it, it might be a little bit different than, than what it actually turned out to be. Can you tell us that story? And how, uh, it's the story of how you accidentally got involved in futures, essentially. And I, I think it's, a, it's one of those uh, serendipitous stories that kind of highlights a person's uh, uh, the good fortune of a, uh, somebody that we were lucky enough to get you in a, a bit of an accident. Serendipity at its best. Yes, I was. I entered law school and uh, was advised, of course, to get a job at a law firm as a clerk and saw this ad um, requiring uh, looking for a runner. I presumed that meant to court. And so I applied for the job and turned out to be a runner on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And it was instant love affair because even though I did become a lawyer and actually quite successful, but my true love began that moment I walked on to the floor of the Chicago Merc and saw the, the weirdest thing, Alice in Wonderland with people running about and shouting. And whatever it was, I said to myself, I wanna be part of it. And, uh, and so, after practicing about six years, um, and as I said, quite successfully, but I was not happy. And the happiness was to become a trader at the Merck. And I made that uh, fateful decision um, in 1965 and uh, sold out my practice um, and began uh, to become a full-time trader at the Merck uh, within two years. I was elected chairman. It's a great story. The point about the runner story was you seem to have believed that a runner being a lawyer was somebody who would uh, be looking like a clerk that would run the court, essentially, not a runner on a trading desk floor, which is what I kind of thought was very funny about that. So you arrived at the CME in the early 1950s. And the CME had been around for a long time. It's, it's the 1890s, as I recall. I, I believe it was the Butter and Egg Board at one point. What was the state of play when you arrived at the CME? I mean, what was it like to trade futures in 1952, for example? Um, just give us a sense well, of what it was when you arrived there. <laughs> it was, uh, uh, to coin a phrase, the, the wild west of, of markets because the exchange, as you said, was a, began as a butter and egg board and didn't get very far. And um, the, it, was, it was a backwater kind of institution whose rules weren't really enforced. And um, it wasn't going anywhere. In fact, it had a pretty bad history. And so that as a lawyer, I recognized from the instant that I became a full-time trader that the first thing somebody has to do is create a system of laws and regulations so that this idea of futures could be applied um, with, without the kind of uh, attitudes that the people on the floor had at the time, uh, really unregulated and really um, not worthy uh, of a major institution. Well, you be a little more specific though. You say Wild West, unworthy of a major institution. What, what was going on? Were people breaking the law? Was it, were people not 
caring what was going on, inventing their own rules. Give us a little more sense. You, you seem to apply, you, you, you found this wild, wild west place, but what does that, what does that mean? Wild well, west? it means that the, at any given time, somebody could corner a market and uh, achieve a great deal of profit without any, without any punishment, without any rancor. And this went on um, incessantly for years, whether it was eggs or pork bellies or cattle later on. Um, the, the rules of the exchange were just simply ignored and people uh, with a lot of money uh, and with a lot of clout uh, were able to violate those rules and uh, corner markets or do all kinds of uh, nonsensical and um, non, non unlawful uh, things so that um, even, even at the instance of uh, running the, the orders to the pit um, from the desk. I mean, there was may, many, many ways to violate the orderly process that it should have been. Yeah, it, it, cornering markets is, is, uh, age, is as old as markets themselves. Jesse Livermore describes attempts to do this in 1900 in Confessions of a Stock Operator in the stock market. Um, what, what's remarkable here is people were able to do it. You have an interesting chapter in your book describing people who tried to corner the onion market at one point, which was very interesting to me. Now, it, just to be clear, it wasn't legal to attempt to corner a market, right? I, I just want to make that clear for everybody. There were people who were circumventing the rules. Am I correct? Or, or, or was it sort of legal for people to acquire so many positions they effectively cornered the market? The, the actually, the onion debacle I ended up in Congress, this was before I arrived on the floor, I think it was 1953 or something, and, um, and they eventually caused Congress to pass a rule that there can't be any future markets on onions. Imagine that, it's the only commodity that there can't be a, a future market on because it so disrupted the world in, the, in onions and um, violated every rule that you could do without the board of directors doing anything or trying even to stop it. So let me move on, because I want to get to the heart of your career. Uh, you became, uh, after stopping being a floor trader, you became the chairman in a few short years. It was 1969, I believe, you became the chairman. So 1972 is when you created the International Monetary Market, the IMM which is the first futures exchange, and you were trading currencies, right? Now, I, I think people ought to know why this is so important. We think of futures traders as um, speculators, and of course, there's a large number of people who are speculators, but of course, there are people who employ them for very practical purposes, the hedgers. Before this, and I don't know if people completely understand this, be before this, if you were an international corporation and you were doing business across many different countries and you had currency exposure, there was no way to effectively hedge the currency exposure at all. And that's what the development of financial futures uh, did, particularly around currency futures uh, in this case. So can you tell us a little bit about why why you, why that moment in 1972? What was going through your mind? I, I described what the, the need was, but tell us a little bit about what happened there very shortly and did you face any opposition from people? Well, you're very right about what the currency market futures uh, provided, um, a means to hedge the risk in, uh, in the changes in values of currencies. The reason that drove me to it was first, I wanted to diversify the exchange. I thought that um, living on pork bellies and butter just wasn't gonna get you into the world of finance or in the world of markets. And at the time, uh, we were still living in, under the Bretton Woods fixed exchange rate system, which was really basically uh, started in 1945, but by 1968, 69 and 70, it was not working very well. Fixed exchange rates simply could not uh, provide the means of cover. But I knew that a futures market um, could provide that kind of hedging ability if the market was uh, regulated and regular. And so uh, when I presented the idea to the board of directors, they laughed at me, what this 
this the kid who isn't even an economist is going to tell us what the trade. And besides that, ag, uh, future markets were basically for agriculture. Nobody realized that they could be applied to other things like finance. And so I had a very, very difficult time uh, trying to convince them that this is a good idea. Um, it, ultimately, I decided that I needed a, a real valid authority to find out whether indeed it was a good idea or not a good idea. And of course, um, the gentleman I'm thinking of is Milton Friedman, who was a professor at the University of Chicago at the time. And I went to him and I said, uh, look, uh, he knew I was chairman of the Merck. Um, I'm thinking about launching uh, currency futures. What do you think? And to my utter amazement and, and great relief, he said, that's a wonderful idea. You must do it. Oh, my God. I said, nobody will believe me that the economist of the world, Milton Friedman, said that. And he said, well, just tell him I said so. I said, no, 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 no. You don't understand what I'm facing. You have to put it in writing. Oh, he laughed. You want a feasibility study on why? currency futures could make a good market? I said, exactly, exactly. Although I wasn't quite sure. And, and so we settled on a, on a cost of $5,000 to, uh, to uh, create a, a uh, feasibility study in favor of future markets and currency. And of course, that led me to the ultimate key of entering the futures market in, in finance. Uh, because I knew that currency uh, was the most important at the time to have when Bretton Woods was coming apart. But I also knew that in finance, um, there was all kinds of instruments that could provide hedging opportunities for markets. Uh, and so I knew that um, breaking the mold, so to speak, into finance was a revolutionary and um, thanks to uh, the paper that uh, Milton provided me, I could say, you don't have to believe me. Uh, I think it's a great idea, but here is a great economist, maybe the greatest of the 20th century, saying that it's a good idea. And of course, um, it, it was the, as I said, key to begin the market, the international monetary market, the IMM. And from that, it led from uh, currency futures to interest rate futures to stock index futures. And as you, Bob, know, because you were part of that moment in time when all of this was happening, um, it changed the world. And future markets today um, are 80 or more percent in finance and um, other than agriculture. I can't hear you, Bob. I can imagine what it must have been like when you presented this idea, because as you said, futures have uh, been around for a long time. The agricultural futures were around since the 1800s, um, but not financial futures. And that's really what we're talking about. <coughs> I just want to go back to the impetus for this, though. What caused you to come up with this idea in 1972? Were people coming to you saying, you know, we're really in, we really got a problem here. You got any ideas, Leo, or what? caused it to happen at this particular moment? Well, I, it, nobody was coming to me with the idea because it was so wild an idea that bringing finance to a, a, a market that trades pork bellies isn't exactly your natural thought process. But I was very, very much aware that the system of fixed exchange rates was simply outdated. It began after the war in 1945. It lasted over 20 years in, in pretty decent shape, but the world was changing. Technology was making news travel at instantly in, in minutes rather than in weeks or months. And therefore the adjustment to prices needed a system that could change not once a year as the Bretton Woods system intended, but in fact, by the minute, by the minute as, as new information comes to the 
world, that information can be translated into uh, prices and the prices can be hedged in a market such as the IMM provided. Yeah, it, it's, it's quite a remarkable story. Now, it, how are you greeted with this idea? I, I mean, I can imagine bankers, I mean, they might say, well, it's one thing for agricultural commodities and futures and things like that, because people have to pick up, you know, know that they want to pick up wheat at a certain time, but financial futures. So did people come up and say, were the bankers against this idea? Was, was there somebody against it? I mean, I can imagine people saying, oh, this is just for a bunch of crazy speculators, you know, I mean, uh, and this is not going to be good for the markets. I also want to talk about the settlement. Now, it was settled and it's always been settled uh, in, in dollars and not in the actual, uh, you, you don't get, you know, the S&P 500 when you settle. Was, can you describe, was that an issue or did you decide to do that in the beginning? Uh, and was that a key to the success? Because the dollar settlement seemed to me to be very important. Yes, you, you're very right. Till, till the moment that you could settle in cash, you had to make delivery of the product you were trading. So whether it was, whether it was cattle or currency, the Japanese yen or the British pound, um, that was what you delivered at the time of maturity. Um, but of course, that is a very a big limitation on what you could trade because not, not everything can be delivered in actual form. For, for instance, stock index markets cannot be delivered very easily, it's an index. And so um, I knew from the beginning that what I needed to do was to change of a need, which was to deliver the product um, and turn it into cash settlement because after all, that's what the market is providing you, an ability to hedge and ensure your risk. And so it can be measured in actual money. How much did it save you or did it save you? And for that, you needed, of course, speculators so that there could be both sides to the market. And you needed a cash settlement, which I uh, approach to the CFTC uh, together with the, the chairman who recently passed away, Phil Johnson, who was chairman of the CFTC and brought to them the idea that the markets could work better, more efficiently if you could allow, instead of physical delivery, you could allow cash settlement of the product involved. Once the CFTC approved that, and that was in 1981, I knew that the sky was the limit in terms of what markets could do, because now you could trade any form of an index. And the first index that we traded were Euro dollars, which was uh, the currency of the, of the dollar uh, floating about in the world, bigger than in the United States. And it had all kinds of interest rate adjusted to it, or, or uh, uh, arranged with uh, the banks uh, of Europe. And in order for that to work, I knew that you needed one index that would be recognized throughout the world uh, as a 90-day instrument of interest rate. And that instrument ended up being a Euro dollar contract, which of course became the most successful uh, market in the world still is in terms of volume. Um, because it could be an index. It also uh, allowed us to go into stock market. The stock market, the stock index market began in 1982 with the standard and poor market. And again, you didn't have to deliver the stock because that would have been, you know, quite difficult, 500 different stocks, et cetera. Whereas in an index, you could just adjust at maturity the amount of money involved. And so that led us to the uh, stock index world and many, many, many other financial instruments. Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate how this evolved here. So 1972, we had futures exchanges and currency. Then we had um, uh, futures on US treasury bills. Uh, that was 1976. Uh, then you had, as you mentioned, the euro dollars in 1981. And then 
stock index futures in 1982. And I'm wondering, we just pause there for a minute because I mean, that really changed my world, the, at the equity world um, rather dramatically uh, after that. Um, it was, as you see this progression here from currency futures to treasury bill futures, to euro dollar futures, to stock index futures, was this just a smooth progression? Uh, when we finally got the stock index futures, were there people who were opposed to this? Uh, at any point, or was the markets now the concept of financial future so ingrained in people's minds by 1982 that there wasn't a lot of, uh, of, of opposition to setting that up? No, you're quite right. There was a great deal of opposition. The banks, uh, particularly New York banks, didn't want this market. They thought that it would be disruptive and that it would take away business from the stock market, which in fact was just the opposite. By providing the New York banks and the dealers with an ability to hedge their risk. They could take larger positions in the stock market. And beginning in 1982, you could see the growth of the stock market in the New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange um, and NASDAQ eventually. You could see the growth in those markets. And, and that was primarily because side by side to that, there was this future market that could be used to hedge risk. So with the ability to hedge that risk, you could take uh, use the money instead of putting it in uh, side for risk and involvement, we're able to use it to build capital markets, to build buildings, to build um, bridges and so forth and so on. And so the futures market were Finally, but it took, as you indicated, it took a long time before the financial world accepted and embraced the idea of a futures market in finance and stock indexes and the like. Well, I can see why, you know, what the bankers think, oh, this is just a lot of speculators out there and do we really need them? I mean, all right, so there's a small number of people who actually need to hedge their positions uh, for legitimate uses. But these speculators out there, are sort of undesirables, does that ever bother you? I mean, in fact, it's true. The, if you look at the number of contracts, speculators are bigger than, than, than hedgers out there. But does that bother you at all? Or is that a natural part of the markets? It seems like well, you're a Milton Freeman guy. It wouldn't bother you. Yeah, well, speculators are a natural consequence of any, any market that has liquidity. Liquidity is the constant bids and offers which provide security that you could use that market and that worry that suddenly you won't have anybody to sell to or to buy from. The speculator is part of that uh, equation because it provides the constant flow of bids and offers, quite different than, than commercial activity, which only does it when it absolutely needs it. And so the speculator became the key to a liquidity factor to create the market with a steady bid and offers. It's true to this day that you need the buyer and the seller to be both commercial and um, speculator. And it, it took a long time to understand that. In fact, I crisscrossed the world um, all, uh, more than a dozen times in an attempt to explain to the financial world and financial ministers, whether they were in Great Britain or France or Germany or Japan or Singapore or Brazil and so forth, and even China today, that the markets of future, futures will help uh, provide the kind of hedging capability that will allow capital markets to grow. Today, of course, every a major city or country has a futures market and um, um, have used it. And now, of course, there is no question that it is an extremely important element in the growth of capital markets around the world. Yeah, amen to that. That was very eloquent, uh, Leo. Uh, and uh, people don't quite understand the role of liquidity. Sometimes you could say it's just, it's a lot of money around and that's true, it's money, but it's also the ability to make trades relatively frictionless um, and without uh, dramatically affecting the price. That's an aspect of liquidity. So it's not just how much money's around, it's how easily can you trade without moving the price around 
uh, too much. And that's a very important part of our system. Chairman Gensler, Gary Gensler, the head of the SEC this morning, in fact, just spoke at a treasury conference where they've been so concerned about illiquidity in the treasury markets recently. You know, they've put out huge amounts of new treasury issuances to deal with COVID. And they want to make sure the market's functioning. And what's happened is some of the primary dealers have stepped back in recent years because of some uh, financial uh, obligations and limitations in their ability to trade. Uh, some hedge fund people have gotten burned, stepped back a little bit. So the market's been filled now essentially with high frequency traders. And Gensler has expressed concerns that they're not entirely in the regulatory structure and wants more regulation around that. So th all of this is a long-winded way of saying Liquidity is absolutely key to the functioning of any market, and you're absolutely right uh, to em emphasize that. I want to move on and talk about 1987, Globex. Now, we have another new revolution that Leo Malamud was involved in. It's the first electronic futures market. And here, I, as an old floor guy, I guess you give a chance to talk about the open outcry system versus the electronic system. Before the CME was an open outcry system we used to do in the 90s. Uh, hand signals on the floor were really not used much at the NYSC, but they were in the futures markets. We used to do explain what they all meant, uh, you know, the fingers up and all of that. Uh, it's a, a sort of a joke when I got here in the 90s. Uh, it was already rather quaint, but if you could just riff on that for a moment, the difference between floor-based system and electronic system and what electronic system offered to the markets. Well, of course, the electronic system made the markets more, more pricing more accurate and faster, and of course, uh, enable, enable the markets to grow. But to move from open outcry to electronic was uh, something that took almost 20 years for me to be able to uh, do that. Um, it began in uh, 1987 when I advised, when I advanced the idea to the board of directors that we open a uh, electronic trade. I had gone to Reuters to ask them if they could build such a system because it wasn't in existence. And of course, they said yes. And as a result of that, I uh, then convinced our board to accept the idea to have a side by side. In the beginning, that's all it was, is an electronic system uh, in addition to the open outcry world that we were living in. Um, the, the beauty of electronics in this case was so obvious to me that it would win. But the unfortunate part is that it took away the, the job of being a broker because now you didn't need a person to intervene between the, the desk when the order comes in and the ex execution by the broker in a pit. It took away his livelihood as it were. And it, of course that's unfortunate, but te technology does that, except that technology also creates more jobs than it takes away. It takes time, doesn't happen overnight, but sure enough, eventually that technology allowed all the markets of the world to grow to their present form. Today, the CME group, uh, one of the largest exchanges in the world, maybe the largest, um, was able to grow on the basis of Globex, which was the instrument of uh, uh, transactional electronics that I introduced back in the idea, at least in 1987. It didn't really um, um, get accepted till uh, in the 90s, as you indicated, and it wasn't fully embraced until 2005 or six. Uh, it took that long for the transformation and today, of course, every market in the world, not just futures, although it began uh, with us, uh, today, all markets in the world are electronically uh, transacted. So it was a, a, difficult, a difficult time and a hard uh, idea to convince the world, but it was done. Yeah, um, and uh, it was an uphill battle here at the New York Stock Exchange too. When I got here, and uh, mid to mid nineties, uh, they were trading in eighths. The spread was an eighth, 12 and a half cents. Then in, I believe it was 97, we went to 16th. And then in 2000, went to pennies. Uh, and of course, by then we'd seen enormous growth of electronic communication networks, alternative trading systems, and the dominance of both the NASDAQ market makers and the 
floor uh, market makers, uh, what became designated market makers was waning. And uh, there was tremendous opposition to that because it was a, quite a business. Imagine trading in eights today. Uh, it's quite a lucrative business to be able to do that. And the monopoly kind of went away. And so there was a lot of resistance to it. A lot of people felt electronic trading opened up a lot of shenanigans, um, uh, but there were floor shenanigans too. So uh, I don't think there's any doubt that it made the markets more efficient and made them more liquid. So I, I certainly agree with your, your point there. Uh, and, let me just go and ahead. I don't for a minute believe that this, uh, this was done by me alone. I mean, I had a lot of help uh, all over the world and particularly on the floor of the Merck and the directors of the Merck and so forth. So um, I may have led the parade, but I, I certainly had an army of uh, believers in this. Uh, not at first, uh, as you indicated, at first it was hotly hated, <laughs> the idea of taking away jobs. And besides that, it, you, you got to remember, open outcry was a thousand year old system. That's what transactions in markets uh, since uh, Japan invented it in 1650. Uh, the idea of rice futures, but it was open outcry. It was people getting together in a pit, shouting at each other and, and making a transaction out of it. Um, so, but, but, but of course, technology took all that away and technology was so dominant in my view, it continues to be so dominant that if people or any industry ignores a technological advancement, uh, they are building right. the demise of their system and their, right. their enterprise. So let me move on with the CME demutualized in 2000. This seems to be another next great event when all of the exchanges essentially did the NYSE a little bit later, uh, NASDAQ as well, but CME demutualized in 2000. Uh, you merged with the Chicago Board of Trade with CBOT in 2007. Then we had the great financial crisis. What did demutualization get you? Uh, and was that an important part in the development uh, of, of the markets? Well, without question, this was this, um, in, the, in the early 2000s, it, it, was, it was clear to me that we needed a great deal of money to build the exchange further and to advance it to a worldwide system. And the only way to have that happen is to have a lot of money uh, to build this, these markets, way to do that is to go public. And so we had to get, convince, um, you know, 5,000 members to vote in favor of giving up the control from the floor to the board of directors, because that's what happens when, when you go public. Well, finally in 2002, actually the Merck, the CME was the very first exchange um, in the world to try to go uh, public with an IPO. And we successfully did that um, in uh, 2002 and, and set a wave and a, a direction for the rest of the world actually in markets. And as you indicated in security markets as well as in futures, that's what it is today. I want to, um move on and sort of talk about the present a little bit and then ask you a couple questions from uh, the listeners. Um, tell me about what you think of financial trading today. Um, are there new products out there that you, you think should be happening, uh, for example? Uh, is, is, there, is there, obviously you're an innovator, so you want more financial innovation, I presume you do. Um, tell us about that. And is there some aspect of this market that you think is unexplored that we ought to have futures in or options that we don't already. Yeah, well, uh, the innovations that have occurred uh, in the last decade or two are incredible, but they continue to uh, be born. Um, the United States, because of its free market uh, attitude and because it, it works, allows people to think and freely think and without restriction, even if they fail, they can try again. So that uh, the US led the world with a great deal of technological advancements today, everybody has adopted most of what we've invented in, in America, including the Chinese uh, who, who took our uh, inventions and used them themselves and, and the rest of the world. And so I, I am a, a total, 
believer that technology cannot be ignored and must be encouraged and so forth. What's ahead? Well, uh, to me, you know, it's hard to, to just name um, anything in, in terms of uh, where it's going, but I believe that the pharmaceutical world uh, needs future markets to reduce the prices of the medicines and medical um, service that it provides. It's, it's an enormous cost to, uh, to invent these things because uh, every thousand uh, are not inventable and maybe one out of a thousand end up to be uh, the, uh, the prescription for COVID-19, for instance. So that it's an enormous cost involved in, in pharmaceutical enterprise. And I believe that futures markets should take a hard look in that direction. Similarly, I think that education has become extremely costly. I don't know if we can find a way to create a futures market that would take up some of the risk involved in education and reduce the prices of education. So here are two areas, certainly uh, the biomedical area is, uh, is one I believe strongly is uh, the future market should look into the future, as it were, into the future. Those are terrific ideas. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about crypto. I have to. Um, here's, a, here's a significant financial innovation. Uh, I'm not talking about Bitcoin, uh, which is a, a cryptocurrency running off the blockchain. I'm talking about the blockchain of decentralized finance. It seems to me to be remarkable potential to reduce friction in financial transactions, for example. Uh, how do I uh, know that I got 100 shares of IBM? It may be able to help in clearing, may be able to help in uh, real estate transactions. Uh, it may be able to help in uh, you know, sending $1,000 to my friend in London rather than getting a VIG from JP Morgan. Uh, so it seems to me there's tremendous potential there, but I'm wondering what, what, what you think of, let's just say blockchain and decentralized finance. Well, to tell you the truth, I'm a little wary uh, of the crypto world, although uh, I wouldn't oppose uh, the development of crypto if the world embraces it. But I believe uh, strongly that it needs a regulatory system that has not yet developed and to, to, to certify that what's going on is in fact um, a business that can help uh, the world. Remember that all the markets that I helped invent had a um, intrinsic value, whether it was even pork bellies or a currency or stocks, there's an intrinsic value involved in cryptocurrency and crypto markets. Uh, that isn't the case and until, until I'm convinced that that the world embraces it in terms of what it needs and to help the values of other instruments, um, then I think one has to be very careful. I wouldn't be against it, but I would, I would, I would urge uh, the regulators to build a system of regulation to make it safer for the public to use. I agree there's no intrinsic value in Bitcoin for sure, but is there an intrinsic value in, in gold? I mean, we have gold futures. Gold's just a lump of metal that sits there. It doesn't really, doesn't really do anything. Yes, you, of course, you're absolutely right. Gold also has very little, um, if any, uh, intrinsic value in terms of the financial world. However, it is historically thousands of years old, and as such, <laughs> the the argument against it is like you you can't you can't do that. So gold is an exception to uh, what I said before, and 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 uh, even silver has intrins intrinsic value. But but with but the given history of gold being an instrument of finance overtakes um, uh, to me um, all the other requirements, and I certainly agree that uh, crypto is an additional tool, perhaps, and yeah. therefore I, I wouldn't be against it. I just simply think that it has to be studied and it has to be regulated. What do you think of some of the trading activity today? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the wild trading in the options market this year um, a, around the meme stocks, around the Reddit stocks. Um, I, I think I saw a stat the other day, half of all options activity in October was tied to trading in either Tesla or Amazon shares. Uh, and I'm talking, I'm 
thinking of the Robin Hood crowd. Does that concern you or is that a natural part of the speculative environment amongst you know people who are relatively new to the markets? It's a natural consequence of advance of technology. There's no doubt about that. And uh, that's unstoppable. It will continue. And as I said, I believe the United States will be the leader in continuing technology to the advances that it, it has a potential. Um, we quantum, quantum theory has provided uh, the world with abilities that we never thought we could have. And uh, um, it will continue to grow. It will continue to give us new ideas and fresh approaches. And that for me is a continuous uh, uh, way the world should work and does work. And I hope we don't do anything to spoil those advances. Well, I, I'm, I don't think we will. I think we do need to find some ways to get certain, uh, certain developments within a tighter regulatory framework. And uh, this is one of the things that Gensler at the SEC has been saying about crypto. I, I, he, you want me to approve Bitcoin ETFs, but I don't have regulatory control over large parts of the crypto space. Therefore, I'm reluctant to do it. So you would agree we, we want financial innovation, but we also need to have clear regulatory rules here, right? No question about it. In fact, I think that was one of my first moves um, as a chairman of the, C, of the CME um, back when Gerald Ford was president, and uh, I was promoting an idea of the creation of the CFTC exactly for the reasons you just outlined. And uh, I met with uh, President Ford at the time, and he, he, he was a very free market guy. And he said, well, why would you want another cop on the block, a federal cop? And I explained to him that our market could not grow without yeah. the regulator and without the laws that make the market safe for the public. So he eventually did not veto the CFTC, thank God. And the CFTC has done a remarkably great yeah. job in being the regulator for futures. I was uh, remiss in noting that the creation of the uh, financial futures by you, the IMM, was coexistent with the creation of the CFTC. I take it that was not entirely coincidental, right? That it, the CFTC was essentially created about the same time. Yes, it was um, actually a little early, earlier because it was upon the CF, building of the structure of the CFTC and its regulations that we were able to proceed with markets. And as I indicated, they eventually understood why uh, physical delivery can be a substituted with cash delivery. The CFTC, to its credit, understood that. And because as a result of that, our markets just um, became so much bigger and better. I want to take a few questions um, from, from some of the listeners. We have some very perceptive questions. Dean's written a couple ones that I think are very good here. Uh, and he asked about the options market here. And, and, and were you involved in the development of options markets too? Uh, and if not, did you have any doubts that options would be equally as successful? Yes, well, I, I was, I've had minimal uh, involvement in the growth of options because I was happy that the Chicago Board Options Exchange was, I think, the, the very first uh, big exchange to, to, to be in, in options. And I encouraged that. Um, and in fact, uh, the uh, license of over using the S&P uh, was ours, and uh, I led to the uh, agreement that gave that right to use by the CBOE. And today, of course, CBOE is one of the very big options markets. So although I, I can't claim that I was involved with its uh, growth, it was, however, um, uh, simultaneous almost with the, it followed the futures market uh, the, the great promoter of that, of course, is the Nobel laureate Myron Scholes, who, uh, together with Bob uh, Martin, um, and um, they launched the, the Black Scholes model, and the Black Scholes model on which the uh, options world was built was certainly encouraged by me, but not uh, led at all. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Dean also asks and this is another good question from Dean. Um, what contacts, uh, what contracts uh, did you th think would be successful but didn't work, and why? Uh, for example, U.S. single stock futures haven't really taken off, and and he's he's right about this. You know, we used to talk about the quarterly explanation expo, uh, expiration of 
uh, options and futures is a quadruple which because it was stock and index options and stock and index futures that expired but single stock futures never really took off i'm talking about quarterly there are some weekly that occasionally will get attached uh, get action from the mean crowd uh but it hasn't um can you address why single stock futures don't seem to be particularly popular but is there anything else that sort of didn't work well it didn't work you're right um there are many many markets that don't work uh, I used to be asked many times whether such and such a market would make a few good futures exchange. And I got to tell you, my answer was, you know, I know of the 12 things that are necessary to make a successful futures market. But the 13th reason is the biggest, and I don't know what it is. And so it, it, it defies uh, my understanding at times. But I recall my first disappointment was in turkeys. Uh, we tried to launch turkeys, Bob. Believe it or not, this is before the IMF. And uh, uh, I was big on, on hoping that the turkey market would be a, a great one for the Merck. Well, it never took off. And I never understood why either. So that you can't always know until you've launched it in the, in the world. I think the best um, denominator uh, for that is, is whether it succeeds or not. The theories are there. And in single stock futures, you have a very good example that the theory is certainly with the market, but in practice, uh, not enough liquidity ever developed. I want to note that you not only are a great writer in, in nonfiction, but a fiction as well. You wrote a 1984 science fiction novel. Now, I, I did not know this about you. I've known you a long time, but I didn't know this about you. And um, yeah, it was about the, the, the Voyager spacecraft and sending, uh, of course, objects about Earth out into space. And Carl Sagan was very involved in that. And, and you actually wrote the book about what would happen when somebody discovers that in the distant future, of course, involving space aliens. I understand you're working on a sequel now, 40 years yes. later. This is very Leo Malamud. The future is 40 years later after his, his last science fiction book. Well, it's true. Um, I was interested in uh, sci-fi even in high school and, and uh, throughout my life. Uh, but NASA's to be credited with the reason for my first science fiction book because they launched in 1973, I think. They launched, I was very busy with the IMF, but they launched what was uh, known as Pioneer 10. It was a space probe. And this space probe was going to leave the solar system. And Carl Sagan, the great uh, astrophysicist, uh, convinced uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, NASA people to put a, a message plaque so that if this Pioneer 10 will float around maybe a million years from now and be found by intelligent uh, beings, uh, they would know who we are, where we are, and so forth. Well, no one wrote the book, but it was obvious to me that uh, a science fiction book could be written about an alien civilization that finds Pioneer 10, and then what happens? So um, in 1983, when Pioneer 10 uh, was about to leave the solar system, I decided to, I, to my, my friend, my herself, sir, um, urged me to write the story. And, and uh, I tried to, I mean, I did. I wrote the first sci-fi book. The most important part of that, Bob, is the computer that I invented for that world uh, was the biggest thing they had. It, it could do a trillion things at the same time. And that computer led me to believe, watching a scene at the Merck with the runners running here and there, hell, if I could imagine a computer of that magnitude, why can't I imagine a little computer just driving an order from the desk to the pit, so to speak, and led me to uh, Globex. I'm, I'm certain that that was in my mind. There, there is a direct link between science fiction and the creation of, of Globex. Thank you for that story very much. Folks, I told you I'd get you out in an hour. It's 1230. That's exactly the right time. Leo Malama, this has been such a, a pleasure to speak with you and an honor to do this. So my, my first duty as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Museum of American Finance. And we're going to be giving a very special award to Leo 
next year for the gala. And maybe I'll just turn it over to David Cowan and let him explain that. Leo, thank you very much. and look forward to talking to you very soon. Yeah, um, thank you very much in the museum. Oh, you're more than welcome. And I have to say, this was no turkey future. This was a phenomenal hour. So thanks so much uh, to Leo and Bob. And yes, you know, as I mentioned earlier, our Financial Innovation Award uh, will be presented to Leo in March of 2022. And we're thrilled about that. Uh, so on behalf of Fordham and the CFA Society of New York and the museum, thanks for such a wonderful and quick moving, fast paced one hour. There's so many more stories in this book. You should read it, everybody, Man of the Futures. And we'll be back uh, December 2nd with Campbell Harvey on decentralized finance. Have a great Thanksgiving, everyone.